yeah, the future of water, I hope that after this uh, talk, and I think this is an appropriate closing event, because uh, I think we should turn it around, and maybe water is our future. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, water splitting in nature and water splitting, uh, how we can mimic it. And I call that photosynthetics. So in the recent years, there's a tremendous amount of photosynthesis researchers who are biophysicists, generally, looking into the biological process of photosynthesis. And in the recent years, that has uh, taken a little bit of a di different direction, namely uh, putting photosynthesis into action. So what can we, how can we use photosynthetic organisms or photosynthetic molecules for uh, energy. And I call that photosynthetics. You uh, cannot Google it because uh, I just made it up uh, last week when I was thinking about this uh, lecture. And uh, so my name is Raoul Frees. I'm from the Foo University of Amsterdam. I'm a biophysicist. And if you, you may think, what has a biophysicist to do with uh, energy? I want to uh, start off with this slide. I think it's one of the most famous uh, physics experiments, also one of the craziest uh, experiments. Uh, here you see Galfani. Uh, around 1790 in Italy, he uh, moved uh, the, the legs of a dead frog uh, by connecting them with uh, metal uh, rods who were uh, charged by static uh, electricity. And the, the legs moved, and it made him to conclude that electricity was uh, an uh, intrinsic part of uh, animals. Now, there was actually a guy who was very much uh, opposed to that. His name was Volta, and he was so much opposed to this that he wanted to prove Galfani wrong. And by doing that, he actually invented the battery. So I think we owe this, owe Galvani a lot. And uh, here, an example, do I have a laser pointer? No, here on the, your right corner, you see an example just of how much out of the box this scientist could think. There was a question of uh, lightning. Is lightning an electrical phenomena? You know Benjamin Franklin, the uh, American, uh, well, the American, who was uh, putting up a kite to, with uh, some keys on it to let it struck by lightning. Well, Galvani did the same, but he hooked his. Uh, dead frog legs uh, to a wire and let lightning strike. And when the frog legs moved, he actually proved that the lightning was also electrical. <laughs> Having said that, what we are about is to use solar energy. And this is a picture just to remind you how much energy is going, uh, how, um, how much en energy we receive on Earth from the sun. In one hour, the sun emits as, uh, enough energy that we can collect on Earth to power the annual human consumption, consumption of, of energy. That is represented by the black dot. So you only need this very tiny little fraction of solar energy to use, used to power all our energy needs. It's such an abundant, it's probably it was just too much abundant. People didn't think that you could use it. Well, it has been used, of course, by photosynthetic organisms. And here you see an annual cycle of photosynthesis on Earth. And you see here, this is from NASA, and you see the forestation disappearance and disappearance of uh, leaves. But uh, don't be fooled, uh, also in the oceans, a lot of photosynthesis takes place. In fact, 50% of all photosynthetic biomass uh, exists in the oceans. So nature has found a way to use solar energy quite well, and we actually use the organisms, of course, uh, uh, after millions of years of photosynthesizing as uh, in form of oil and gas. Uh, but maybe there's a smarter way of doing that, especially because those uh, we are running out of those uh, fossil fuels. Now, here's the uh, scheme of the uh, perfect solution, let's say, how biology uh, uh, responded to this uh, great energy source up in the sky and all this water around. The most logical thing is that you use the water, use this great energy source to power uh, whatever you need to power, whatever you need energy for. Uh, microorganisms uh, have done it. Uh, now, of course, uh, we also should do it. And you see here how photosynthesis works. It's, uh, there are the light reactions. That is what I'm going to talk about. And in these light reactions, actually, water is being split. And uh, the protons and the electrons are being fed it downstream for other, uh, for, for other reactions to power the Kelvin cycle. There's not hydrogen produced. It's uh, produced in the form of NADPH. I will show you that here. Here you see how biology does it and also how technology does it. It's a comparison. You, do, you see it's not too different how we do it and how nature does it. Uh, instead of uh, electromot uh, electromotive force, uh, protomotive force is being created, the proton gradient across a membrane. There are little nano machines, molecular machines that do that uh, to power all kinds of processes. Uh, ATP is generated. Um, now I should have a laser pointer, actually. Maybe you have a laser pointer, fine. Thank you very much. All right. The, the, the most important part of uh, photosynthesis is a little bit hidden here. So here's the water splitting. The oxygen is released. It's a waste product. Nothing is done in photosynthesis. 
Uh, here is the, what the if, instead of molecular hydrogen and a DPH, this is where the hydrogen goes to. And that's being fed into the Kelvin cycle to generate sugars. Very important. It actually takes up CO2. That is, of course, what photosynthesis does. So if you would be able to use this process for your energy needs and actually use CO2, you would actually get rid of it, which is obvious uh, a very good thing. People are looking uh, for uh, the perfect photosynthetic organism, so one that makes uh, lipids uh, that you could use for biodiesel in, in a very efficient way that still grows even if it's in uh, dim light. Um, well, in general, uh, people use synthetic biology. They try to strip a bacterium uh, from all uh, unnecessary, let's say, uh, uh, reactions that take place and only make it drive it to make biodiesel. And in general, you can call this thing the trillion dollar cell as uh, if this would replace all fossil fuels. I'm not going to talk about that. It's not really my work uh, to do that. I'm going to talk about using the molecular machines of photosynthesis. And uh, not everybody knows uh, biology too well, so let me take you back to your high school. Uh, bi uh, biology uh, proteins are being uh, made. They originate from uh, amino acid polymers. You see here this chain is being expressed by the DNA and expressed in the RNA. And you get this chain of molecules. These are, here you have two amino acids, so these could be parts of this chain. And they're be, just being linked together, covalently linked, for instance, to form a long strand. What is very special about biological proteins is that these are not random polymers, like uh, you maybe know of other polymers. These are very structured, so you have, there are specific interactions between all these types of amino acids, and they form these beautiful structures like these alpha helices or sheets. And the alpha helices also can fold uh, on top of each other in a very distinct way. Now, just to, uh, this sheet is just to inform you that I will talk about protein complexes. So these kind of proteins can also form a complex again of a big, gigantic molecule, typically of a couple of nanometers uh, long, wide, and high, to perform specific functions. Now, these proteins are, is very, are very special materials uh, in the sense that it allows nature to very precisely control the function of whatever nanomachine it's being produced is being, uh, being produced. So here you see a, a, a structure that I'm going to talk about. It's a light absorbing protein. Uh, here, here are the proteins. It's a beautiful circular structure. It consists of alpha helices, as you see here. These are chlorophyll, the light absorbing molecules. And this whole structure is being made just by repeating this unit into this beautiful circle. And you get a six nanometer diameter uh, structure with something like 36 light absorbing molecules. What do these molecules do? Well, they absorb light and they transfer the energy. And I hope that works. Here you see uh, one of these large photosynthetic molecules. All the green things here are chlorophylls. Light can be absorbed by these chlorophylls itself. This is a target. You will see it later on. It can also absorb light. I hope you see it with, all the, with the intense light. So if an excitation reaches, you get an ex excitation being shared among these chlorophylls until it reach the, reaches the target, and there an electron, tra electron transfer event is being initiated. So let's have, a side, let's have a side view of that. So in fact, the target, the funny thing is that the target also consists of similar chlorophyll molecules. Here, energy transfer, here, electron transfer. That's the protein that actually induces these different reactions. So now we have a charge separated state here. It's only four uh, nanometer uh, wide, and the whole process is over in 20 picoseconds. Now what is needed here is that protons are being taken up. This, uh, there's a, a molecule that uh, does this. It's actually dissociating from this structure towards the target, and then this is neutral. Now we only need to re-reduce this uh, positive side, and that's actually done by water. And only nature can do that. So nature can split water. So why does it split water? Because it needs the electrons in the, for the, first, uh, in the first place. It needs the electron to re-reduce the uh, final uh, or the initial electron transferring component. Here you see the, there's a very, yeah, this is not very clear. Let's go here. The part of the, there's a, here you have a photosystem. So these are all these proteins in green. I hope you see it. You see all these different chlorophylls. And here in this little part, that is where the magic happens. It's a manganese cluster, and it's a cube. It's almost science fiction. It's a cube, and that can actually split water. And it's this reaction. And what is so special about it? Well, actually many things, but the mo one of very important parts is actually that it produces oxygen. So oxygen is very reactive. And it's very, uh, it, can, it can be very damaging as a radical. These are the radicals for which you actually eat car carrots or uh, tomatoes, you know, that protects you for this, or vitamin C. 
protection for these radicals. In nature, there's also many protective uh, mechanisms for that. But this is very reactive, especially with all the ele electrons around. And to split it, you need to split it, and you have to collect four electrons before you actually have split it. And these electrons with oxygen, again, are also very reactive. So this is a very, let's say, biologically dangerous reaction. Having said that, besides the water splitting, photosynthesis is also a solar cell, a p-photovoltaic solar cell as we know it. There, this is another organism that doesn't split water actually, but it does cycle electrons. So this is a little battery, light-powered battery. You see here the, um, the systems again that I talked about a little bit. Ultra-fast energy transfer to this, to, again to a target. The designs are very, very similar on all, in different species. Here you see light absorbance. And these rings, oh, this one is moved a bit, but these rings are really to in, enhance the absorbance of light. So this little target, it can, oh, it's also moved, sorry, it can absorb a little bit of light represented here, but these rings actually increase light absorbance enormously. Now, just a few uh, other aspects of uh, why these material, from a material point of view, photosynthetic proteins are very interesting. Here you see an atomic force microscopy image. It was the, f the first uh, real photograph of a biological membrane with proteins inside. And what is striking is that these membranes are really stuffed and packed with proteins. And it actually led to the conclusion that these membranes, maybe those who know that, membranes are thought of consisting of lipids, a lipid bilayer in which proteins are floating. Well, in fact, what we show is that it's more a protein bilayer. So the lipids are basically just on the sides and on s small spots, but the whole thing is made out of protein, and we could actually simulate, we could actually make a model of the whole membrane, as you see here. It's a spherical uh, thing. With every atom known where it is, we can simulate this, the formation of such a membrane easily by having a two-particle model uh, where everything is self-organizing into this structure. There are many more aspects to it, but I'll leave it to that. What is funny is that there is this uh, fluid phase created and a uh, crystalline phase, which is absolutely necessary for photosynthesis because energy, for energy transfer, everything has to be close together. But you need a fluid phase just to ha have dynamics and adaptation occurring. So I think this, is, uh, this slide exemplifies a little bit the uh, specificity of, the, of using biological material in uh, maybe for something else. I will come to that later just to show you that these uh, systems are really uh, dynamic. Here you see a plant membrane. It contains these kind of structures. And here, all these little bright spots are part of this structure, randomly organized. But if you lower the temperature, you will suddenly see that everything starts to organize in neat rows. So you have changed it from here to here. So how I see it is that these protein complexes from photosynthesis are actually building blocks. They are building blocks for nature. So nature uses these building blocks to create whatever structure it wants and whatever is needed, given certain light conditions, uh, environment. And the question now is, uh, can we also use these building blocks to make solar cells? There are three that I showed you here. The exotonic building block, this is the light harvesting. This is this six nanometer cylinder with 36 light absorbers. If an ex excitation hits, the, the light energy is being uh, distributed among these. And when there's one next to it, it will tra be transferred to it with 100% efficiency. There's no energy loss in these systems. Here you have a photovoltaic building block. It's like this, but then with a target inside. Excitations distributed among the ring. Here, initiate electron transfers, 100% quantum efficiency. Every photon that's being absorbed leads to a specific electron transfer event. All the electrons that are being transferred are going one direction. There are, not, there are no... Uh, whole uh, uh, electron recombination going on. And you have these catalytic building blocks. These are the water splitters. So these are, it's a combination of all these uh, units, and they can also split water. So what can you do with that? Well, one thing is you can try to pattern this on the surface and see if you can actually move photosynthesis outside the cell and put it onto a solar cell. A little bit indicated like this. Yeah, you can do that. You can also make use of the self-assembly self -assembly properties of these structures. Here you see again this cylinder, six nanometer, and it's self-assembled in this beautiful semi-crystalline structure. Totally connected. If you excite it here, the light will go all the way along these lines. You can make patterns like here. This is a little bit outside of the nanometer range, but nevertheless, small patterns. These are fluorescent. These things fluoresce, so you can easily detect it. As you see here. So that was for uh, light harvesting and energy transfer. Can you also get a current out of these uh, bio... Uh, Polymers, yes, you can. Here you have again the photovoltaic unit, as I showed you here before. It actually contains a cysteine, for those who want to know it. It actually can hook up to uh, electrodes very easily. Here we increase the light, 
and you have to believe me, but these are the specific absorbance bands of pigments in here. And you can see that in current, we measure in a photocurrent, and these absorbance bands appear more light than all these absorbent bands. Maximum photocurrent is 25 microamps, which is uh, fair. It's uh, not a world record, but uh, you have to re realize that this is a, uh, a molecular monolayer, so we have just one layer on, on atomically flat uh, uh, electrode. Strangely enough, what is found very recently by uh, our group and also by others is that sometimes these proteins actually function better outside the cell. They function better on an electrode, which is also counterintuitive. You would think these proteins, they need to stay in the cell, they have a specific environment, and very fragile. Well, basically they are not. They, they run perfectly well. You can irradiate them with enormous amount of light. So this is the sun, let's say. So you can have, go to uh, five suns, if you like. Uh, you can do this in air. So there's oxygen present and nothing is being quenched, for those who know what that is. Uh, we calculate that these, uh, these units have made 10 million cycles uh, during this time. This is a long time course, three days, it goes on and on. And then during the time that made 10 million cycles per unit, while in nature it's generally 1 million cycles. So here, uh, just to finish up this part, is that uh, there are many ideas, of course. I cannot uh, cover them all, but uh, people are playing around with a lot. This is like a basic design. You have to use a lot of light from the sun, so you do not... This is where photosynthesis is, in this blue part. Well, some of them do it on the red. This is def definitely neglected. So you want to take as much of the, photo photo of the solar spectrum to drive your reactions. There, we've been tinkering with the protein complex, at least uh, biochemists do, to make stacks. So these things do not exist in nature. So now you are directing some, uh, some uh, three-dimensional structure. Uh, of course, we are also mimicking uh, the photosynthetic uh, complexes. So you can make mimics of, uh, of uh, other molecules, synthetic molecules, that can do water splitting and light absorbance. It's, it's, it's a little bit difficult not to make them run, not to have electron transfer events, not to uh, split water. But what is very difficult is to how to control uh, their structure, the meta structure in a solar cell because they do not have this matrix of a protein that prevents aggregation and all sorts of nasty things. Well, to end up, uh, the experimental part at least, maybe you don't even have to direct too much uh, with your, uh, on your electrodes or on your solar cell or, or your patterns. You can also let the cells make a desired uh, stru structure or assembly themselves. And you can actually adhere a whole membrane, like I showed here on the AFM, you can adhere that and connect that with an electrode. If you shine light on it, you measure a photocurrent. That's what you see here. So here in red, it's the absorbance of these uh, cells. And in black dots, it's the photocurrent perfectly following uh, the absorbance of the material. You can also do it with a water splitting enzyme. And this is very recent uh, work. Um, this is the plant membrane. So you can shine a light on it. You, some light is lost by emission. Electrons, when, ele when electrons are detected, you're sure you have split water, so there are also protons. Here we, detect a, here we detect electrons. So this is a current, light goes on, boom, current goes up. Steady current, if you shut off the light, current goes down. Well, this is basically what I wanted to show you. I didn't want to show you too much details. Just to show you that I'm not the only crazy guy uh, in this field, this is uh, from a totally different group. Uh, I call this Galfani Revisited. It's where algae are being uh, poked with a nano... Uh, nanometer-sized uh, uh, metal rod. It's actually from an AFM tip. And they, they, it's alive. So here are alive algae in the tube. And this rod actually sticks in. And when you shine light on it, you can actually measure, well, some photocurrent. I don't know if this is, the, this is going to be the, uh, the future, but uh, uh, this is actually uh, basically where I wanted to end. I want to uh, ask you one, one question, actually, and that is that when uh, Volta invented this battery, I give you a few seconds to think about it. When Volta invented this battery, what do you think was the first thing that was actually applied with it? So when a battery is about, there were not appliances lying around waiting to be powered by a battery. Does anybody have any idea what was the first man-made use of a battery? Just think about it a little bit. It was actually a telegraph, uh, uh, telegraph uh, system. Uh, in around 1790, Galfani moved the frog's legs. Around 1800, uh, Volta made his uh, battery. Around 1830, the battery was improved so much that the telegraph could be powered. In 1859, there was a telegraph cable from the US here to Ireland, to the UK, and the American president could send a message to the, to the queen. So you never know where everything goes uh, when biophysicists uh, start to uh, mess around. And uh, I want to leave you just with this little thought uh, to end uh, this talk. 
from uh, Jules Verne around the same time that that cable was laid. This was what Jules Verne wrote in a letter to a friend of him. I believe that water will one day be used as a fuel because the hydrogen oxygen which constitute it, used separately or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light. I believe, I therefore believe that when coal deposits are oxidized, we will heat ourselves by means of water. Water is the fuel of the future. Thank you very much.